Welcome, everybody. Uh, we're going to get started with today's program. Thank you very much for joining us today for this event on educating California's future workforce. I'm Mark Baldessari, President and CEO of the Public Policy Institute of California. For those of you who aren't familiar with our organization, PPIC is a nonpartisan think tank based in San Francisco and in Sacramento. Um, just so happens our, the chair of our board is here today, Gary Hart, who was a member of the legislature for 20 years, both in the Assembly and the Senate. Gary, thank you for joining us. Um, this event is part of the James Irvine Foundation briefing series, and we would like to thank uh, the James Irvine Foundation for making it possible to bring this program to all of you today and to bring all this food to you today for lunch. Um, we'd, we would uh, first like to bring to your attention a couple of the handouts that you should have found on your chair. Let me go get them. First of all, I would like to uh, point out the, uh, the document um, that's in my hand, which is our brand new report, our newest report, by Sarah Bone, Belinda Reyes, and Hans Johnson. Thank you for the report, and Belinda in her absence today. Uh, titled, The Impact of Budget Cuts on California's Community Colleges which has gotten so much attention today, uh, which you're going to be hearing about. It documents how California's community colleges have adapted to the budget constraints and how this has affected students. So this is, uh, please, for your reading pleasure, very important. Also included on your chair, you will find a piece on California's Future Workforce by Hans Johnson, part of a, a larger package and packet uh, on California 2025 planning for a better future, one of 10 uh, such uh, briefing documents that we have in uh, our kit for policymakers. And this particular one highlights the state's most pressing long-term issues related to the uh, California workforce. A few more things before we begin. You should have received an evaluation survey. This you're hearing from PPIC's pollster now. Please fill out the evaluation on your chair, and we ask that you please uh, drop it off at the registration table on your way out. Uh, surveys of this sort very helpful for us in uh, planning future events at PPIC. And finally, if you haven't done so already, turn off your cell phone. I was looking for mine to see if I <laughs> had mine to turn off. Uh, but please turn off the cell phones, um, just like if you're in a movie theater or anywhere else. It kind of, can kind of be disruptive for the people around you. No texting and no, uh, <laughs> and no use of cell phones. Um, and now onto the program. Um, it's really a, a pleasure, a delight to um, introduce my two colleagues who are here today from uh, uh, the Public Policy Institute of California, uh, PPIC Bren Fellow, Hans Johnson, who's been with uh, the Institute longer than I've been at the Institute, and uh, has been contributed to so much work that we've done in so many different areas in demography um, and in education. He is going to, taking from the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the piece that you have on California's workforce, uh, provide a basic overview on the, the workforce and educational trends that face California today and in the future, which I think is very informative work um, for you. And next, um, my PPIC colleague, research fellow, Sarah Bone, will focus on the state's community college system. Um, Sarah's spent the morning talking on uh, the radio and to, to, to journalists all over about our, our new project, uh, which a new report that's out today and she will focus on the state's community college system, the largest provider of higher education in the state, with new findings that we have uh, out today on the impact of the budget cuts on the system. Now it's time to turn it over to my colleagues. Thank you. So um, 
As Mark said, I'm going to provide a little bit of context uh, for Sarah's uh, study, so I'm going to be pretty short here. There's two statistics I want you to remember from my uh, short comments here. Uh, the first one is one million, and the second one is 82 cents. <laughs> and I'll explain those. So about seven years ago, PPIC began a series of studies that we call California 2025. And just as the name implies, the focus of those studies was on California's long-term future. We found that one of the largest impediments to success for our state, both economically and for the residents of our state, is something we call the workforce skills gap. And specifically, what we mean by that is that our economy is increasingly demanding more highly educated workers, just as it has done for decades. Yet our population and our higher education institutions and our policymakers, I would say, are not responding to that challenge. That is, we're not keeping up with the demand for more highly trained and highly educated workers. Our projections suggest that by 2025, here's the first statistic, California will fall one million college graduates short of where economic demand would otherwise be. And others have estimated that the, and by college graduates in our work, we've been focusing on people with a bachelor's degree. Others have estimated that the shortage of people with other forms of post-secondary education uh, exceeds uh, another million on top of that. So uh, we've embarked on a series of studies since we developed um, that first set of studies, looking at how California could close this education skills gap. And our focus in all of these studies is not necessarily what's best for uh, the universities or the colleges themselves. It's on what is best for Californians and for California students. And we have a number of recommendations. And you can go to our website and click on the higher education uh, button and, and see a number of our, our studies. But in a nutshell, I would say most of our recommendations come down to three primary areas. The first is we say that the state needs to establish new goals to increase the number of students both in college and the number of students graduating from college. The second is that the state needs to find ways to fund those goals. And the third is that the state needs to be smart about the kinds of funding and the kinds of investments it makes. And being smart means collecting and using data effectively so that the decisions you made are based on empirical understandings of what works and what doesn't work. These seem relatively modest uh, 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 proposals, um, but uh, I'm sorry to stay, say that I think there's still a lot of work to be done in California uh, to follow them. Now, looking at higher education over the last five or 10 years, the single largest policy intervention in higher education is actually what, we would, what we've called a defunding of higher education in California. And specifically, what I mean by that is general fund appropriations to our higher education systems, that is the University of California, the California State University system, and the California Community College system have declined. And this is by far the high, largest higher education policy issue that we have um, dealt with in, in, in California. In a nutshell, our priorities as a state have changed. Uh, and they've changed not as the result of a deliberative process, but really as a consequence of putting out budget fires. And let me give you a sense by what I mean that our priorities have changed. Ten years ago, for every general fund dollar that went to corrections, $1.89 of general fund appropriations went to UC, CSU, or the community colleges. In 2011-12, for every corrections dollar, UC, CSU, and the community colleges received, here's your second statistic, 82 cents. A dramatic decline relative to corrections over that last, over that 10-year period. Adjusted for inflation on a per student basis, general fund contributions to UC and CSU are lower now than at any time in the past 40 years. So we've done a number of studies at PPIC about the effects of this defunding of higher education. Our first study focused on UC and CSU, and as I said, that's available at our website. And as you can imagine, the effects are not moving us in the direction of closing that workforce skills gap that I mentioned earlier. Now Sarah is going to present our results looking at the effect of budget cuts on community colleges. And our purpose in all of this work is not to be uh, doomsdayers uh, and gloomy forecasters. 
It is in, instead to provide factual information about decisions that we have made as a state, realizing that the decisions we have made are decisions that we can change and we can make different, directions, different decisions going forward to put ourselves on a new direction. Certainly there is uh, some good news right now. Uh, the current uh, proposed budget, for example, restores some, by no means not all, but restores some of the funding cuts that we've experienced in the past in higher education. So now I'm going to turn it over to Sarah, who will talk about the impact of budget cuts on California's community colleges. Thank you all a lot for coming to hear about our research. Um, and I just wanted to reiterate the, uh, the co-authors of this report, along with myself, Haas Johnson, and Belinda Reyes at San Francisco State. And we also want to acknowledge research support from a number of people who helped us complete this project. Um, and those include David Ezekiel, Janine Hawk, Kurt Trader, Ramon Hernandez, and Miguel Torres. And lastly, but not least, we gratefully acknowledge um, financial support from a number of sources, including the Dun Donald Bren Foundation, the Evelyn and Walter Haas Jr. Fund, and the James Irvine Foundation. And these all helped us complete this project. So we're very grateful. So why are we looking at community colleges? Um, I suspect because you're here, um, I maybe don't need to reiterate this, but for the record, California's community college system is the largest public higher education system in the country. Uh, it's the entry point for many in California, a diverse population, um, their entry point to higher education. Um, serving about 2.4 million students over the 2010-11 academic year, um, the system is made up of over 100 colleges across the state um, and is a key segment of the state's master plan for higher education um, that intended to use the colleges to ensure access for all Californians who could benefit from some instruction. The colleges serve multiple missions and uh, we try to think about them in kind of four broad categories. Um, those are the mission of uh, academic coursework towards degrees um, and towards transfer for uh, transfer to four-year colleges, um, career technical education certification, um, basic skills development, so remediation type of activities, as well as adult enrichment. And this is kind of a four-pronged mission. We find that the community colleges in our state are facing the lowest level of funding on a per student basis in two decades. And our goal was to systematically examine the data um, and, and, ex and think about what impacts this is having in terms of what specifically is offered by the colleges and what are the impacts on students, how are they faring. Um, what we find is that cuts were sustained across all of those missions of the colleges that I just cited. Um, faculty um, and staff saw declines in their employment levels with the end result that we estimate about 600,000 fewer students were served by the system. In order to arrive at these conclusions, uh, we examined official publicly available data from the Community College Chancellor's Office, and, and I think it's worth commending the Chancellor's Office for providing this, this really breadth and depth of information. It's publicly available. You can access it yourself on DataVart, um, and, and that's really a testament to the, the transparency um, it, in the, in the community college system. And it really helped us complete this project, and as well as the staff who helped us understand some of the data. Um, so in light of the, this is just a, a brief preview in case you need to leave early, and I'm gonna go more in depth on, on, e on each of these findings. Uh, and to give you a bit of a roadmap of where I'm um, planning to spend the time this afternoon, um, I'll start by giving you some specifics on how the budgets of community colleges look and how they've changed in recent years. Um, and then examine how the colleges have adjusted in terms of what they offer, um, services, <laughs> courses, and, and the staff um, that really make the work of the colleges happen. Uh, and then we'll look at the effects on students and conclude with some policy considerations and options. So here's the picture um, of the budgets that community colleges in California are facing. The top red line shows the funding per student um, on a full-time equivalent basis. And you can see that from a peak before the recession, it has declined significantly um, down to the lowest level on a per student basis that we've seen since about the, the mid-early 90s. Um, this is about a 21% decline. Um, <clears throat> and 
uh, you can see that most of the, the funding for, for uh, students at community colleges comes from the state general fund. That's the, the second line that you see that's in orange. Um, and you can see that most of the change in budgets has been coming from um, that change in state general support. In total, when we look at the actual full number of dollars that are in the system, the budgets fell by about $1.5 billion from before the recession until the most recent year in 2012. Um, Proposition 30 and the governor's proposed budget um, are likely to make up some of that, uh, that decline, but on the order of about $600 million is the estimate um, if the governor's proposal is, is passed. Um, and so that only goes part of the way in making up for that $1.5 billion in losses. Uh, another point that I want to um, raise from this chart is that uh, it's hard to kind of tell um, the student fee line is, is actually a dotted green line that's at the very bottom of this chart. And you can see quite clearly that it makes up a very small fraction of the funding picture um, for community colleges. Um, and I wanted to highlight some of the trends there um, because this can be important for the students that are accessing the system. Um, we see that even though fees make up a small percentage of funding, the overall funding picture for the colleges, they have been increasing substantially. Um, from in the early 80s and before, actually no fees were charged. This is part of the master plan's vision of providing free access. Um, it's no longer quite free um, and has tripled since the recession and in recent years doubled. It's important to note that uh, community colleges don't have the discretion to change fees in the system. This is set by the legislature. Um, and so the college system has limited ability to generate revenue, especially through, through changing fees. And the other important consideration, which we may have time to discuss a bit more later, is that many students don't pay fees in the colleges thanks to the Board of Governors fee waiver program for students in need. So some questions about how the system is doing are hard to get at through, um, through just looking at the data on colleges and students. And so in addition to examining the, the uh, chancellor's office data, we also conducted a survey of senior administrators across the college system. And this we did it, uh, in the fall of 2012. Um, the, the people that we surveyed are about 300 what we call senior administrators, so CFOs, vice presidents of um, business affairs and academic affairs. Um, we sent them our survey and about a third of them responded, over a hundred responded, um, and we asked them a, a wide variety of questions and I'll, I'll cite some of those along the way as we, as we go. One of the questions we asked was for a subjective measure of how their institutions um, uh, financial health was doing. And the most common response that they were do was that their college was doing was in fair health. About 40% responded that, that way. A smaller percentage, about 30, said they were in good health, and about 20% said that their institutions were in poor or failing health. Um, and even after the passage of Prop 30, when we asked about what are the most important challenges going forward in the next two years, they, the most common, commonly cited answers were budget constraints, declining state support, and the potential for future cuts. So with this um, somewhat dire budget scenario in mind, we went to examining how the colleges are coping with the severity of budget cuts and the number of years that they've been seeing, seeing declines in, in the funding available for their activities. Um, and what we tried to think about was kind of the major categories of where they might trim their budgets, um, courses, um, faculty and staff, and services. And, and we tried to take the lens of what missions of the colleges are most affected by these cuts. So first, let's look at course offerings. We found dramatic declines in, in the number of course sections that were offered. I don't think this is a surpri surprise to too many people, um, but the scale of it is, is substantial. So the number of courses in total declined about 20% from before the recession until 2012. That's a decline of about 100,000 course sections. And you can see um, it kind of jumped out at us when we looked at the data, just the substantial component that credit courses make up in, in this overall picture. So credit courses at colleges are, are those that students take for transfer, for um, degree or certification. Um, Non-credit courses tend to be those that are um, related to adult enrichment and some, sometimes remediation. And you can see that 
um, the vast majority of courses and activities at the colleges are for credit. Um, these, um, these, in our survey, administrators reported that those were some of the, the highest priority missions of their colleges, were training students for the workforce and f preparing them to transfer for four, to four-year colleges. But you can see that, you know, even if they, even if they cut all of the non-credit courses, um, they still wouldn't have been able to achieve this, this overall decline in, in the courses that appears to be necessitated by the, um, the budget constraints that they're facing. So next we tried to look a little bit more closely at what kinds of courses um, were being cut. And um, let me start by um, looking, thinking about kind of the bottom bars that you see here and thinking about non-credit courses. Um, as, a, as a percentage, non-credit courses declined the most. 35% um, decline in the number of non-credit sections offered between fall 2008 and fall 2011. Um, the, the bulk of that decline is coming from cuts to courses for older adults, a 58% decline in the number of courses for older adults. And this might be related to what one of our um, surveyed administrators said was that we're taking the community out of community colleges. So, so that's a concern about one of the, the four missions of the colleges. But when we think about the, the, the missions towards um, transfer and, and preparing workers preparing workers in California, we see that those, those areas were impacted as well. So looking at the top bars, these are declines in credit courses. Um, credit courses were cut as well by on the order of about 14 percent. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's in some areas that are rather surprising. So a 20 percent decline in the number of sections in engineering and industrial technologies, which we would think is probably more closely related to the kind of workforce needs um, and, and the classes that might be in high demand, um, as well as courses in education. A lot of that decline is coming from uh, a drop in physical education courses and also interdisciplinary studies, which is uh, one of the major categories of decline there is in, is in um, career counseling and guidance, um, but also public and protective services, business management courses, as well as fine arts and humanities. So it seems, it's, these seem to indicate that, um, that due to the size of the budget cuts, the colleges couldn't just trim around the edges of courses that, you know, are, are kind of perceived as being not quite as, as central. Um, but as the, the cuts have really impacted uh, all of their major areas. So one way to cope with course cuts would be to increase course size. And the colleges have done that. Um, this data shows that we're at about a, a decade high in the size of courses. The specific statistic that is, is shown here is the median number of students in a section. And you can see it's at a, at a high we haven't seen since at least 2000. So um, one commonly cited story is that students are having trouble getting courses that they need, and this isn't surprising given how many courses have been cut. But it is something that's hard to get at with, uh, with real detailed robust statistics because if students can't get a course, they can't enroll, they don't show up in the data. They might not even show up to the colleges at all. And so it's a little bit hard to get at um, this question. And one way is to think about how many students are waitlisted. And we would love if there was a great measure of that, but that's not collected systematically either. So this is one of the questions that we asked administrators in our survey. Uh, and 79% of them said that at their institutions, wait lists have been growing over the past two years. Similarly, the, the chancellor's office conducted a survey of college presidents. I think it was last summer. It was a bit before our survey. And 85% of the, the, their survey, survey respondents said that, that their colleges had wait lists with a subjective estimate of about 500,000 students on wait lists. Now this number is probably duplicated. Students could be on multiple wait lists. Um, so, so it's just, uh, just to give a kind of sense of the scale of the problem of how, how students are having trouble getting the classes that they need. Another major category of spending, of course, for the community college system is in staffing. Um, and the largest category of employees are involved in credit instruction. That is the top orange line that you see here. And in fact, uh, employees in credit instruction is where the, most of the cuts have been made and 
during the recession on the order of about 10% decline and full-time equivalent staff involved in credit instruction. Uh, and and one th a couple things that this statistic misses that I think are worth pointing out is one, workload. So we see that, and it's in the paper, um, I, I, I wish I could tell you the page it's on if you wanted to look at it right now, but what we see is that uh, faculty are, are handling more students per person. And so it, that's one indication that their workload may be increasing um, for those who are still employed there. And in addition, um, these, these raw statistics on just the number of employees doesn't account for the total cost of, of hiring people, um, so including their wages and benefits. And in our survey of senior administrators, uh, many of them indicated that they've either already implemented freezes on benefits or salary or, or declines or, and or considering that in the future. So the next largest category of staffing um, that you can see in this chart is the red line, which is um, staff involved in operations and support activities, which is a pretty wide variety of activities, um, anything from, you know, the operations of the colleges to student support services, instructional support, um, and, and may indicate, may have impacts on instruction, um, as well as impacts on student success. So um, looking at, at, at uh, uh, staff and faculty involved in guidance and counseling, um, you know, maybe related to the services available to students that can help them make sufficient progress and navigate this, this large, complex system. Uh, I wanted to note one last thing on this slide. Uh, the line, the blue line towards the bottom is the number of staff in executive and administrative uh, positions. And you can see that that's actually quite small relative to um, the other two categories that I've just discussed. Um, on this topic, we asked administrators um, if they've implemented streamlining in administrative positions and reorganization of administrative units to try to trim their budgets. And that, in fact, um, they said yes. That was the most common answer to the question about how they were dealing with budget constraints. So I wanted to move on now to talking about how students are faring in light of these cutbacks um, that the, the colleges have experienced. And I'm going to talk first about access and then look at s some measures of student success. So one of the most striking results that we found was this two-decade low in the participation rate in the community colleges. This could be also called an enrollment rate. So this is the share of Californians of college-going age that are attending California's community colleges. And it's at a two-decade low. So we estimate that had the participation rate, the enrollment rate, remained at the level that it was in 2008, the system would have been serving 600,000 additional students. So that comes from the fact that about 500,000 fewer students are actually enrolled, and at the same time, the population in the state of college-going age is increasing. So if we think about who the system is aiming to serve, it's actually even a more striking decline than if we just looked at, at enrollment. Um, and that's what the top line is noting. Um, you may notice the difference between these lines with the flat, the bottom one is pretty flat. That's the enrollment rate, the participation rate um, for full-time equivalent students. And so, and, and it declined by less. And so we think that it might be that, um, that the, the decline in enrollment is mostly affecting part-time students, which is of concern because there are certainly people in California who need to, to you know, work part-time and go to school part-time. So given this two-decade low in participation rate, which students are still accessing the community colleges? Um, we think that enrollment priorities are really the key consideration here. In our survey uh, of the largest student groups, um, the highest priority was given to continuing students in enrollment. Um, and, and this bears itself out in the data. So when we look at continuing students, those are students with um, consecutive enrollment um, uh, semester to semester, we see that actually their enrollment has increased. And you may um, be surprised by these enrollment numbers that are in the first two columns. This, these are adding enrollment across the fall and the spring semester, so it's kind of duplicating a little bit, but what we're trying to get at is this kind of average percentage change from before the recession through 2012 um, in enrollment by these various groups of students. So what we see is that it's continue, among continuing students, that's the only group where enrollment was actually increasing. 
Um, of the two next largest groups of students, um, we find significant declines in their enrollment. Um, the first is in returning students. So these are any student who, who were, was enrolled in, in a semester and then had some time away, um, one primary semester or more, and then um, would come back to the colleges and we see a decline in the number of those type of students on the order of about 32% during the recession um, until now. Um, and then last, uh, first time students. So these are first time enrollees in the system and their enrollment has declined by about 20%. And this is a particular concern uh, given the need to increase college going among Californians as, as Hans talked about a little bit earlier in solving our workforce skills gap. And so we wanted to look a little bit more closely at those first time students um, and what these graphs show is how the number of, college, number of high school graduates in, in California has been increasing. Um, whether we measure in the fall or the spring, the orange line shows the number of high school graduates in the, in the state, and the bottom line shows the number of first-time students that are young, so they're 19 or less, and, they're, and these are the number that are enrolling in California's community colleges. Um, and you can see that this gap between the number of high school graduates, graduates and those enrolling in community colleges is growing. In fact, over the last few years, looking just at the fall term, the, I think the precise numbers are um, a 9% increase in the number of high school graduates and at the same time a 5% decrease in the number of, of young first time college goers in the, in the community college system. Um, and beyond just this gap that's widening, um, it doesn't appear that these students are alternately going to the UC or CSU, as Han's previous report on defunding higher education showed. And so the question and the concern is that these students are not able to access higher education um, in California. So we next look at um, how students in the system, what types of courses they are taking. And we see um, that enrollment in transfer courses has declined the least. Um, it's, it's pretty small relative to other categories. So students enrolled in courses that are for transfer credit um, fell about 1% between fall 2008 and 2011, um, which is small compared to the other two categories shown here, basic skills and vocational education or career technical courses, um, which fell 12 and 6% uh, respectively. So this may be some indication that administrators and colleges are trying to protect their, what, what they reported to us were the highest priority missions of their colleges, which were pre preparing students for transfer and for workforce, uh, for the workforce. But clearly um, that vocational education decline is particularly troubling because many students um, are, are, are interested in taking um, career technical certification as, as their entryway um, to workforce opportunities. Uh, so when we think about what students look like who are still in community colleges in light of these budget cuts, we see that the makeup of the student body has shifted in some ways and not in others. Um, where it's shifted the most is in the age composition. So the largest percentage decline in the colleges occurred among the youngest students and the oldest. And by the youngest, I mean those who are less than 18. So these are likely to be um, actually high school students who are taking college courses and they're less likely to do so now um, because uh, probably because uh, it's difficult to obtain the courses that they need. And the oldest students, which is probably related in part to um, those that major decline in courses for older, older adults that I showed you earlier. But in terms of just the number, the biggest number change that we see in the makeup of the student body is among 18 to 19 year olds, that same group that I focused on earlier though, that are likely to be recent high school graduates and who are not showing up in the system now. Uh, one piece of, I would say, good news is that we don't see major um, shifts in the ethnic composition of students in community colleges from what we've seen in the data. There are declines across all the major racial ethnic groups um, in terms of who's enrolled in participating in, in the community college system. Um, Latino student population actually has um, the, the smallest drop so they stayed about the same in terms of the number enrolled, although their participation rate did decline slowly, slightly, and part that shows that the, the population of Latino students who are, are likely to attend college is growing at the same time that enrollment is, is staying the same. 
So for the students who are still accessing um, the community college system, what do their outcomes look at? Um, in the interest of time, I am going to show you one of the success measures that we look at, um, course completion, and please refer to the paper for a couple additional success measures that we looked at, including transfer and success in courses. The trends in general, I would say, are, are similar. So let's look at, um, the. this is the percentage of students who complete a course. Um, it's alternately called the retention rate. And we see that the retention rate, the com course completion rate, has been improving. Um, across all of these major categories that we look at in terms of course type. So vocational, career technical courses, degree courses, credit, transferable courses, and, and basic skills. Um, the long-term trend appears that it, course completion rate was already increasing, but it looks like it got a little bit of a bump during the recent recession. And why would this be? So it might be that um, this is part of a long-term trend and efforts at the colleges to increase their success rate among students, to try to um, emphasize student success in their various policies. So maybe that's just what we're observing here. It could also be that the incentives for students to stay in and do well in a course are, are higher when it's hard to get a course. So they have much more, um, they invest much more of their effort into completing that course and passing that course so they don't have to try to take it again and, and go through the whole, you know, wait listing and course rationing um, scenario. Also in light of course rationing, um, it, it might mean that the most motivated students or those who are most able to navigate and persevere through um, getting on wait lists and getting into courses, maybe those are the students that, that end up taking the courses. And so these are possibly students who would do would have done better anyway in the course and so maybe that's why we're seeing um, success on this measure in improving despite the budget cuts and last I would offer um, another potential explanation and that's related to the outside opportunities um, with the the um, the economic um, opportunities in California and nationwide being constrained I think we're all aware that uh, it's more and more the case that you need some college education in order to get a good paying job. And so perhaps this outs creates an outside incentive for students in the community colleges to, to complete their courses and, and move on with their educational goals. So there's multiple things that might be behind this improvement um, in course completion. And with the data that we have now, we weren't quite able to sort out the different mechanisms. But all in all, we, this, is, this is a good thing. Students who are in the community college system appear to be doing better on the various measures that we looked at. But um, a, a lot of the focus has been on, on improving these measures. And I think that um, in light of the data that we showed you on, on the, the number of students um, that are, are able to access the system, it's worth bringing back the question of access along with the, the questions that we're dealing with on, on success for students. Um, <clears throat> I think that really the, the budget, one way to think about the, the, budgets, the budget situation that we're in now is to take it as an opportunity to reevaluate the, the missions and the priorities of the community colleges and to really engage in the debate that Hans was ha presenting at the beginning of the talk. Um, to think about what are the priorities of our higher education system, how are the community colleges fitting into that, what students are they intended to serve, and how can we fund them appropriately to achieve those goals. Uh, and I would put forward two key considerations to that debate. The first re re reiterates, excuse me, uh, what Hans was talking about at the beginning, the need for California to educate the workforce of the future. So that it requires us to, to bring more and more Californians actually into the higher education system. As part of um, the engine of growth for California's economy, as well as to increase the income and, and the economic success of families in the state. And the second uh, consideration I would add to the debate is to, to think about the vision for the community colleges that included in the master plan and historically what has been their role to serve as an entry point to higher education for a wide variety of students um, and across a number of different missions. And if these are the goals, then I think that the data that we, we present raise some questions about the ability of the system to actually achieve them with this level of funding. Um, and with that said, um, 
we think there are a number of options worth considering. Um, first would be a restoration of additional funding from the state, uh, and absent that, uh, looking for ways to find new funding sources. Uh, that could be potentially from local parcel taxes. A few college districts have passed that um, have had those passed su successfully, but only a few. Um, an additional source might be to leverage federal funds like Pell Grant funds. Um, and last, um, to consider increases or changes in the fee structure um, for students. Uh, uh, the last option we would throw out is, is to look for new efficiencies in how to provide education to the wide variety of Californians that the system is serving. And of course, some combination of all of these options is, is probably the way to go. And it is crucial to have this conversation and to evaluate the priorities of the community college system we have and, and really understand what funding level is needed to achieve those goals. And we hope that in this report, we've, we've laid some of the groundwork and provided hard facts um, that, that can help ground the debate on, on where to go uh, moving forward. Um, and we thank you for your attention and for coming, and Hans and I will be happy to take your questions.